Hi, I'm Wayne Jones. Welcome to Editing Writing. This is episode 11, Mixed Metaphors. What's wrong with this picture? So in a moment, I'll talk about what exactly uh, mixed metaphors are and what metaphors are. But I wanted to start by saying, uh, frankly, both of them, uh, metaphors themselves and uh, mixed metaphors are very common occurrence in, in language and in either speaking or writing. It's, it's really all around us. Uh, unfortunately for mixed metaphors, as I'll talk about in this episode, uh, but uh, you'll you know hear it in the media, you hear it in conversation, you see it in academic writing, you see it in books. I see it in a lot of things that I edit, and you know will I guess I will say always, virtually always, always <laughs> point it out to the writer. Uh, sometimes give them a choice. Uh, if it's a mixed metaphor, I will you know simply call them on it and say you know you really can't do this. Uh, this needs to be fixed, uh, sort of thing. And it's very important to to do that because it's a it's a blot basically on writing. In conversation, you can excuse people. You know, I, you know, when when you talk, you're not sort of uh, often don't have the uh, the time or the you know the idea is not that you're coming out with perfect prose all the time. But when you're writing, uh, you know, you have the time, and you should these things deserve attention. So, so basically a metaphor is, as you know, we, we, we all probably learned in school, is basically just a phrase in the language that conjure, conjures up an image. So all sorts of things. Life is a hamburger. Uh, if you were, you know, if, if, you, if you wanted a picture of a, a mother who was holding her child very tightly, you could say that she held on to her treasure you know, and that conjures up an image of, it makes a kind of equivalence between the child and a treasure. And, and that's the whole idea of metaphors in the first place. The idea is to make a comparison between two things, even to say that they are, quote unquote, the same. I mean, that's the whole purpose of it. Uh, and when a metaphor is done badly, it, it kind of falls flat, as I'll talk about later when a, when a a uh, mixed metaphor is done at all, uh, it falls flat and then tips over and then falls off a cliff somewhere because uh, it's really a, a, a horrible thing in the uh, in the language. But it, uh, metaphors themselves, you know, the creation of images, I mean, uh, good writing is built on that. You know, uh, ac uh, literary writing is built on that. Uh, one of my favorite the. Uh, Shakespeare plays and one of my favorite uh, lines I always remember these lines from Richard the third and it's basically uh, Queen Elizabeth talking to Richard referring to his killing uh, of her sons the little uh, princes princes and here's the quote from Shakespeare uh, I mean written by Shakespeare but this is Queen Elizabeth talking to Richard no doubt the murderous knife was dull and blunt till it was whetted on thy stone hard heart to revel in the entrails of my lambs i mean that is that that's <laughs> that's why shakespeare is shakespeare that kind of language just to sort of analyze it a little bit i mean uh, Basically, it's taking, you know, basically it's making a comparison between his heart as a stone. And not only that, that's something enough in itself. If someone has a, a, a heart that's hard as a stone. But then what Shakespeare does is take that and because the princes were killed with knives, you know, say that the, the knives were sharp or dull until they were sharpened on the stone, which is his heart. And that's sort of, I mean, doubling up on it like that is just, and I don't mean to sound frivolous about Shakespeare in that way, but that's 
that's extremely, extremely well done writing. And then uh, to revel in the entrails of my lambs. So you have lambs. You know, basically it's setting up, the entire thing is setting up an image of someone using a knife to kill lambs. And the whole thing about reveling in the entrails, I mean, that also itself conjures up, again, an image that fits with what's going on. But it's not just, when I see rebel in the entrails, uh, it's not just a sort of, a, uh, you know, a simple stabbing where someone... You know, you stab someone in the stomach or you stab someone in the back and they just fall over dead. But reveling in the entrails means that you're gruesomely killing uh, someone. I just want to read those again. Those are, as I say, those these are some of my favorite lines from, uh, uh, from any writing anywhere. No doubt the murderous knife was dull and blunt till it was whetted on the, thy stone-hard heart to revel in the entrails of my lambs. That is just, <laughs> I don't know. There's not much I can say. That's uh, that's writing. That's how writing is done. If you, if you want to know, <laughs> maybe it'd be nice. You know, all you have to do is write forever like those three lines and uh, you're doing well. You're doing really well. So, <laughs> um, so that's a metaphor. A conjuring up an image, conjuring up a picture. Uh, a mixed metaphor doesn't have any beauty about it, uh, like I was just saying, or doesn't have any accuracy about it, and is not to be recommended except in parody, if you're making fun of something. They're really easy to spot. I mean, it's basically a mixed metaphor, as it implies, means that there's more than one metaphor happening. There's more than one picture that's being uh, that's being conjured up. So basically what it is, is that two or more images are called up at the same time, but they physically or literally don't make sense, can't make sense, are impossible to exist in the universe. And they're often very ridiculous and funny to think about when you try to picture them. Uh, and you don't have to search far. I just have a few examples here, and these are just ones one that I just heard on the, the 6 o'clock news about uh, five hours ago. And you don't have to search far for these. And uh, uh, I'll give the examples. And then I want to say a little bit about, um, you know, why people write like this. Uh, uh, and this is, uh, these are all from, uh, I think one of them is from someone speaking. So perhaps you have to give maybe, uh, allow a little, um uh, lenience there if someone is caught on the spot but some of them were from the scripts you know from uh, from uh, news scripts kind of thing and they should be aware of these things that you know should have a second look at it and say oh maybe there's something going on here that's wrong so I heard one recently that was here it is quote the optics are tone deaf so <laughs> So, I mean, just try to picture that. You know what people are talking, when they talk about the optics of something, they'll talk about, um, you know, for example, the optics of uh, Boris Johnson attending those, all those parties, whereas he's given to, given instructions to the rest of the country to stay two meters apart and all that. The optics are not good there. You know, his optics are not good. Uh, tone deaf, I mean, I would make an argument actually that that's a, maybe I wouldn't use that term anymore anyway because it's a little I would say politically incorrect it's a little ableist as they say uh, but you definitely should not be using both of those together because one is referring to vision and one is referring to hearing so the optics are tone deaf it's uh, you know, you just it's got your head gets a little woozy just trying to picture what the hell uh, someone is talking about there. And there's always a solution to these things. I mean, and I'll talk about that a bit later. But here I'll just say is that either come up with some other images or take one of the images and de-image it and just say it it's sort of in plain language. You know, the optics are terrible. The optics are hypocritical, whatever it might be. 
but if you're going to use two images, make sure they match. That's the, that's the key point. Uh, another one I heard recently, quote, he's threatening to upset the apple cart on some of the things that they're holding dear. So this is another one where, uh, not to mention the apple cart, but basically the image you have here is that, you know, someone, what, what someone wants to say in this, in this sentence, I think, is that, um, you know, uh, some people have some ideas that they hold uh, very important to themselves and someone else is trying to uh, uh, get rid of those or to threaten those or to uh, uh, remove those, that sort of thing. He's threatening to upset the apple cart on some of the things that they're holding dear. And just also, I would say, just listen to the way I read that. I mean, it's this is probably why they're part of the reason why they're so easy. It sounds like perfectly good English. It is, grammatically speaking, perfectly good English. But the image that is suggesting here is not quite, is ridiculous and is not what I think the, a writer would want if they were looking at this more than once. Because the image that you have is of someone holding something dear so, I mean, I think when they were uh, uh, talking about this, this was talking about ideas. So the idea now has been transformed into something that you would hold dear, like say, for example, you might hold a, ch a baby kind of thing. And someone is threatening to upset an apple cart on top of that. So when I see this, this is a serious thing that's being said here, or that's trying to be said here. But when I see it, 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 it's it's funny and it shouldn't be because what I see is someone lying on the ground holding a baby and there's another guy with an apple cart that he's going to throw on top of them. And, you know, that's... Uh, I don't know. <laughs> My head is about to hit the desk here. Uh, but that's not... That, that's just not right. You know, that's not what was intended. And the tone of it, because it's all mixed up like that because you have the two images mixed up. It 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 kills the tone. The tone was meant to be serious. You're not supposed to have a guy like me laughing at the fact that, you know, someone's the dearest ideas, the most important ideas that someone holds are under threat somehow. I'm not supposed to be laughing at that. Uh <laughs> Maybe I'm the problem. Maybe mixed metaphors are a perfectly good thing, but somehow I don't know how to read. Maybe that's what it is. That's not what it is, uh, believe me. Uh, and just on the news today, I heard one that was, and I again, I give the guy a little, um, a little lenience with this because I think it was a, a quote, but this is really one where I think you'll see, I hope, if you haven't already, what I'm getting at. So here is the quote. This refers to the protesters, I think, that were not the ones that are here in Ottawa, but the ones that are at the um, the bridge, the International Bridge, is that what it's called, in between Windsor and, uh, and the United States. Uh, so, quote, The protesters have set off an economic atom bomb and are trying to hijack the country. <laughs> so, oh boy, yeah, so. <laughs> So that's this is the thing. You can see there are two images here. One is setting off a bomb, an atom bomb, for one thing. I'm, that, do we really call it that anymore? Aren't they called nuclear bombs or nuclear weapons? That's another issue with this. Atom bomb sounds very 60s-ish to me. Uh, so I would look into that, too, if I were editing that, that sentence. And so yeah, on one uh, side, or to start, you have setting off a bomb and then by setting up this bomb you're trying to hijack the country and hijacking of course refers to you know what you do in a plane what you you take something captive you take uh, so if you look at this is how you know that it's a mixed metaphor because logically there's no logic in what that is saying you can't set off a nuclear weapon that somehow hijacks an airplane <laughs> you know? 
Uh, I, I don't know. That would be a really smart bomb if that were the case, if, that, if you could do that. But then again, here I am. This is a very serious thing, you know. I mean, this I, I can speak for myself here and say this, uh, whatever they call it, uh, depends on which... Uh, which flavor of the media you're you're listening to? This protest or this occupation that's happening in Ottawa is very serious, and the one in Windsor is just as serious. And the language shouldn't be this ridiculous that you should have any kind of uh, happy happy feels about it. It's not a happy feel thing. So, uh, yeah. So those are just some examples. I mean, th those are three examples out of the 30, 100 trillion that you could mention that you hear all the time, but uh, perhaps you get the idea of what's going on. Basically, two pictures created, it creates an image that is physically impossible or that sounds ridiculous when you see it. It is physically possible, but uh, it, it, it destroys the tone of what you're, of what you're trying to say. And you see, actually, in the in the one of the examples that I mentioned there, the one about the apple cart, this is also often one of the characteristics, or one of the um, causes, or one of the parts of a of a mixed metaphor is basically a cliche. This thing about upsetting the apple cart. I guess the first thing is I would say about that is that even alone and by itself, without being in a mixed metaphor. It feels like an outdated image. It feels like an outdated cliche. Uh, you know, you don't hear that upsetting the apple cart. Uh, I suppose you do hear it occasionally. I certainly would never use it. And if I were editing someone's text, I would point it out to them as something not to be uh, not to be used. And basically, what cliches are? Uh, these cliches are images too. A single cliche is a single image. Uh, they used to be fresh, uh, no pun intended with the apple cart, when they were first coined, but now they you know, completely lack imagination and vitality. There's no one who hears upsetting the apple cart and thinks, oh my God, what an evocative picture that creates, because it's been used and overused and stomped on and, and it's just old and, and, and faded now, and, and it's not to be... It doesn't have the power that it used to have. Uh, and that's, in fact, part, I think, of the reason why people do mix their metaphors is because they don't really see the picture anymore. You know, they don't... When, when someone uses the phrase upsetting the apple cart, uh, someone doesn't see the image of the apple cart, that kind of thing. It's just a... It's something that means... All they see is what it means. They don't see the picture that it creates. And if you're not seeing the first picture of a cliche or of an image, and that means you're not going to see the second one. And that means that you won't see that together. They just don't work. So, uh, you know, and I think I really think that's that's why a lot of it has uh, that's why you, you get so much uh, of a mixed metaphor is because there's a lot of cliches involved and people don't see the picture and and therefore you end up seeing the mixed and uh, it's not a pretty sight so in a certain way and I just want to say in passing I don't want to spend too much time on this but in a certain way uh, they're the opposite of a good pun a pun is is a basically something that conjures up two images with just one expression so it's uh, you know, there are bad puns and they're usually ones where the conjuring up of the images is done in a kind of a clunky or ham-handed or very obvious sort of way but very witty puns are, are are an excellent use of the language and can be good not only as part of uh, jokes and things like that but also in your writing as well uh, they can they can work uh, really excellently. I mean, it, it's sort of the, as I say, it's sort of the opposite of a mixed metaphor. It, it, but it's trying to achieve the same thing. A good pun makes an equivalence or a comparison between the two things that it conjures up, and it makes one of them seem silly or knocks the pretension out of it or something like that. So it's kind of a, an opposite there. Um, I guess on if you were setting up the um, the spectrum or the uh, 
you know, the range on one end would be a really bad mixed metaphor, and on the other end would be a really good pun. But they would have something in common in that they both are have in them two images. One done really well, one uh, that deserves uh, to be buried. <laughs> so... Um, so, I mean, that's uh, when, as I was mentioning a little bit throughout this about the editing that I do, and I do see this, and um, uh, mixed metaphors are really, I mean, I, I think I can say, I will say pretty categorically, something to avoid in your writing. This is not something to have in your writing. There's nothing good about it. It's not uh, bringing anything to your work. It's not making people think that uh, you can create good pictures. Uh, I mean, the way to do it, if you're a writer of any kind, is that when you're, you know, when you're about to pull out that, pull that apple cart out of the old barn kind of thing or wherever it is, think up an image yourself, you know, think of what, think up something else. Uh, and I don't mean an orange cart. I mean, you know, think of something else that evokes that same sort of, um, or that conjures up that same sort of image. I mean, that's that's the whole purpose, really, of um, of creative writing, of literary writing, of good, solid writing, is that you you know you create new stuff. You don't you're not pulling on old things all the time. Uh, uh, so that's one thing. Leave the apple cart there. Let's let it just. Uh, you know, the wood fall off, the wheels fall off, and sometimes someone will creakily open the door and look in, and someone will look in and they'll they'll have a flashlight and they'll look in and they'll see this decrepit old thing in there that smells a little bit. And uh, Sally will say to Johnny, Johnny, what is that? And Johnny will say, I think it used to be an apple cart, but I, for the life of me, I can't really see it now. That's where we should leave it. Leave it. Sally and Johnny should close the door and leave it in there, and maybe set the barn on fire. That might be a good idea too. Um, let me pull back a bit and and get serious. Uh, what I'm the the two points I want to leave you with is that one is to avoid cliches. Uh, that's very important. The apple cart is a cliche. There's no getting around it. Try not to use it. Think up your own image. You know that that's that's important. And vitally, vitally important is that whether you're using cliches or not, if you're using language that involves conjuring up an image and within that, you know, talking about the same subject, you're using something, another image, make sure that those images physically make sense, that you can actually, you know, s s sit back uh, and visualize it and it actually make sense and even better not only makes sense but actually uh, enhances the quality and uh, of what you're trying to say and even helps the reader uh, understand even more the gist of what you're trying to say just by virtue of how great the two images are so i'll leave it there uh for this episode thanks again i super appreciate uh, you're listening. Uh, as I say uh, every time, please, if you want to comment, if you have some suggestions about things you want to, me to talk about in future episodes, or if you have critiques or criticisms or whatevers, uh, please just go to waynejones.ca and you'll be able to find this podcast and be able to send me an email, call me, text me, uh, whatever you might want to do. Again, thanks very much, and uh, we'll talk again soon.